you will be more productive, you will be more efficient, you will enter flow state easier if you are connected to other people, people that bring you joy. If you don't have that in your life, there will be a big hole that drains everything else and everything else will be much more difficult. Hello, intelligent beings of this marvelous planet. Welcome to Learn From The Brands, our podcast for you from 42courses.com. Today you'll hear tips to help normalize the conversation around mental health and smashing the stigma to reach better mental well-being. Rob Stevenson is a mental health campaigner. He's the founder of the Inside Out Leaderboard, which showcases senior workplace leaders who are open about the fact that they have a mental health challenge. Rob always speaks openly about his own diagnosis of bipolar disorder and how that affected his life story. He is also the founder of Formscore, which is a movement, website and mobile app which helps you keep track of how you're feeling and connect with those around you during tough times. Rob is a fantastic keynote speaker and was a standout hit recently at Nudgestock 2021. So I am super happy that he's here today. I'm delighted to give a huge welcome to Rob Stevenson. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me. Good to be here. The main reason for speaking to you today is to speak about your uh, getting up and driving your funky soul with your July well-being sprint form booster. Do you want to tell us about that, please, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. So look, I'm I'm a mental health campaigner on a mission of inspiring us all to be a little bit more intentional uh, about well-being. And and by that, I mean, you know, build up the self-awareness as to what is affecting our well-being and then take action um, to proactively manage it. So the form booster, 30 day form booster, it's a well-being sprint. It's 30 days of kind of bite sized snackable videos where I just talk at the camera, have some fun. I even sing on a few of them um, against the the advice of my wife, who's a pretty good singer and I'm not, to um, just inspire us to think about our well-being differently and to become that little bit more intentional, that to proactively manage it. Because I think, you know, if we can if we can do that, if we can find out those nuggets of well-being that really apply to us, we can be happier, we can be healthier, and we can be more productive. And that's the, that's the mission, but making it easy in a, a little bite-sized snackable video. And how do people get hold of that content, Rob? So if you um, go to uh, Formscore YouTube channel, that's where we're hosting them. We've got a, pl- a playlist called the uh, the 30 Day Form Booster. It's also going to be on our website, formscore.today. Um, those are the two, two main places. Okay. Um, and is it free? Yep, it's free. Yeah. A lot of the stuff I do is um, is, is free because um, I think it's really important to just put this stuff out there to, to help people on this agenda. Um, so I've been a mental health campaigner for four years now, um, but I'm really passionate about creating content and having really stimulating conversations that just inspire everyone to you know proactively manage their well-being. So yeah, definitely free. And talking of stimulating and inspirational, now the first time I uh, knew about you to my shame was uh, recently at Nudgestock when you came on and it was a very active chat already but when you spoke and told us your story I mean it went on fire so it was really um, something special in that day was it special for you? It was it was Brent thank you and uh, I don't experience imposter syndrome right and I know many of us do but I have to say that I was listening to some of the greatest thinkers in the world on that nudge talk say stage before I was doing my presentation. Um, you know, we'd got Nobel Prize winners, we'd got Rory Sutherland, we got John Cleese, and I, and I'm thinking, why am I here? And and it was a real moment for me where I had to sort of sense check myself and think, wow, um, you know, you, you're here with your very simple concept of asking you how you, how you are today with a score out of ten and the whole form score thing. And I really had to kind of just have a word with myself and think, no, no, you know, your idea is good and people will resonate with it. And then obviously when I started presenting, you get into it, but it was a fantastic experience because as you say, the the interactive element of what I did with the people sending their scores via an online poll that was very visual, really engaged the chat. And, And obviously the personal story, my personal story about bipolar disorder and, you know, trying to end my life at one point um, and my journey to recovery and to be a campaigner. 
I think it resonated with a lot of people and it didn't resonate because I'm the greatest thinker in the world. I'm not. It, I think it resonated because so many of us experience a mental health challenge, but actually do so in silence because of the stigma. Um, and that with the interaction made it a, a pretty electric presentation. But I was so grateful to be in that company on that stage. It was. You did absolutely marvelously well, honestly. And yeah, the, I was monitoring the chat for 42 courses uh, yeah. pretty much all day. And it just blew up when you when you were yeah. speaking. I think it's because of the humility, the honesty, as you say, the story. It was just, yeah, people were entirely 100% engaged. It was awesome. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, thank you for your kind words. I was literally blown away by the response. And, you know, it's nice to know that, that my words are resonating on this really important topic. Now, I uh, was really excited to speak to you um because of your nudge stock appearance um and i asked friends and people on twitter and linkedin and stuff like you know what kind of questions would you like to ask rob so i've got actually some questions from Brilliant. various people they're not all mine but i think they're really interesting questions so um one of the first ones was um should we define it as mental health or should we call it neural diversity what's your opinion there um, I've got a pretty strong opinion on that because I think the two are very distinct. Okay, mm -hmm. you so mental health, um, and and before I even answer that question, there's another distinction I want to make. That mental health we all have, right? We we all have mental health, and some of us will have a mental illness, a diagnosable condition. All of us will experience mental ill health, just like we do physical ill health. So you know, it's not black and white. It's not well or ill. So you know, even the people that are generally um, mentally well will experience um, a high degree of stress at times, will experience the concerns about the global economy at times or the worries about the pandemic. So I think mental health is a, a continuum of you know, struggling through to thriving, well through to ill, that we all oscillate daily and hourly uh, up and down. Now, neurodiversity um, is a separate issue to mental health and mental illness. So neurodiverse people that might experience uh, autism or uh, attention deficit disorder. So these are things that you're born with um, and need to be managed. Um, often a mental illness is something that, in my understanding of it, is can be triggered by trauma or events in life. Now, Autism, if you've got autism or you're on the autism spectrum, you can then experience a mental health challenge. But I think it's um, too often these, these are lumped together and they're very separate. Um, so, you know, we, we need to smash the stigma of mental ill health in our workplaces. We also need to have workplace cultures that are, um, are conducive to hiring neurodiverse thinkers and people. Yeah. Um, now, I think I've read it somewhere where you said that you want to inspire workplaces where people can put their hands up and say, hey, I'm struggling with mental health. Um, is there still um, quite a big stigma, as you say, attached to saying mental ill health rather than well-being? Is, or, or should we forget about the stigma and we're, we've gone past that and it's okay to say I'm, I'm struggling with mental ill health? So there's a good friend of mine, um, and, and his name is Jeff McDonald, and Jeff was one of my inspirations for coming out and sharing my story of mental illness. And, and Jeff, I think, has, would, would say in the UK, we've seen progress. Um, he's been a campaigner against stigma for probably 10 years now. And, and I notice in his keynotes, because I hear him talk regularly, he, he, he used to say we're, we're just in the foothills of smashing stigma. Uh, but there's still the mountain to climb. He now says we're in base camp. So I think we've moved along a little bit, right? But the mountain is still very much there to climb. So I think in the UK, stigma definitely still exists. People are still fearful of talking about mental illness and thinking that they'll be perceived differently, that their career will be affected, that they might not get a bonus or a promotion. Um, but a lot of good work has been done uh, from campaigners, from workplaces, from politicians from you know thought leaders on smashing stigma in the uk um and i think we are getting to a point where we're getting more open cultures now we're nowhere near where we need to be but we've progressed but if you look at the if you look at the world um and globally and you look at pockets if you go to asia the stigma is still very much uh, alive and present and you do not talk about mental ill health uh, same in the middle east cultures um, and these are often signs of weakness uh, in 
I've got a role model on part of what I do is the inside out leaderboard where I showcase business leaders, workplace leaders who are open about their challenges. And one of one of my role models uh, is from Nepalese descent. His parents are Nepalese. And he tells me that there's no word for mental illness in Nepalese. There's a word for crazy, but not not mental illness. Mm. And so you, you've, you've even got stigmas within the language in certain cultures. So the stigma globally definitely exists. There's a lot of people working to change it. There's a lot of good work being done. There's so much more to do. And I, for me, I think even in the UK, it's a 10 year project at best where people will feel no shame no stigma for talking about mental illness like we would uh, like we wouldn't feel for a physical health challenge now maybe taking that first step higher out of base camp um what can managers uh team leaders people at work just friends colleagues at work what what can they do to uh to help in this you know the next steps up is it is it asking the how are you today like you've got in your backdrop is it and then the double asking, I think you were saying in Nudge Dog. Yeah, I, th- I think that's part of it. Um, and, and for me, that, that that's around creating cultures of care. It's around recognising that right now, many of us will be struggling uh, with our mental health. You know, the pandemic will have created um, a, a lot more incidences of, of people struggling with depression, anxiety, um, trauma, PTSD. We'll, we'll start to see those cases come through. But, but I think actually to answer your question, how can we start moving above base camp? For me, the most powerful thing is storytelling. Um, it's storytelling um, at a senior leader level. Um, so leaders sharing their stories of mental ill health within their workplace to say, actually, it is OK to talk about mental illness and that doesn't damage your career. You know, we've I've been promoted because despite or because of my, my challenges. I think it's also uh, you know, having employee resource groups where people have got somewhere to go to receive support from their peers. It's it's um, it's having benefits and solutions in the the organisation that managers and leaders role model by using and visibly using and, and talking about that. So I think there's multiple levels to it, but we're all where the stigma of mental ill health is concerned. It's about normalising the conversation. I think where where it's where it's important to ask that question, how are you today right now, is because we're, we don't have the visual cues that we might have had prior to the pandemic because we've all been working remotely and we're talking about work, go, moving to hybrid work models. Um, so how are we knowing when a colleague might be struggling, you know, because we're hiding behind, you know, a Zoom screen, a team screen. And we're not seeing those behavior changes. So asking that question, how are you today? And the today bit adds a level of emphasis and immediacy and a thought that we might want to you know, get the answer um, or ask it twice um, as, a, as, a, as a way of reinforcing that question to say, actually, I'm really, I really care about you, um, my colleagues, my, my, my direct reports, other people in the business. And I want to know how you're doing and have that sense of curiosity and, and wait and listen to the answer. And don't be afraid of the answer, right? And this is actually why I was really wanting to speak to you, because I, I, I've i done a few years in corporate, um, just recently come to 42 courses. But um, and I was a, a leader of quite a few people. And I used to ask this same question in one to ones, um, not the form score, but I just say, how, how are you feeling out of 10? Yeah. And then when people gave the answer, I would say, and and what would make it a one higher and then what would make it a one lower? And it just uh, helped people examine some things going on. Well, that's a, that's a brilliant way of looking at it. And that's at the essence of what form score is all about. It's thinking, OK, I'm a seven today. What's what's stopping me being an eight? Now, I know I didn't sleep long enough last night. I had to get up early and I was to bed later than I should have been. So, OK, that's manageable. I can get a good night's sleep tonight and hopefully I'll be an eight tomorrow. But if it's something fun, more fundamental, that's the self-awareness that allows you to then change behavior, change lifestyle, take a break, reconnect with family, whatever it might be, to ultimately try to be thriving or more towards thriving more of the time. But also if someone is then you know, a four or a three, it's thinking, okay, how long have you been there? What's driving it? Is this a, a prompt to um, seek professional help, to see a mm-hmm. therapist, to use the employee assistance program if you've got that in the workplace, to go and see a doctor, whatever, whatever resources you've got at your disposal, it's the awareness that actually now might be a time to do it. But I love that idea of 
you know, marginal gains, micro steps, incremental small change based on increased knowledge. And I think that knowledge is really powerful in, in being able to facilitate that change. And are there any um, techniques to help, like you're saying, you know, zooming to your colleagues and stuff, is there any, are there any um, techniques to help spot mental health issues? So I, I think we need to create spaces um, to um, and psychologically safe spaces where people feel more comfortable in opening up about how they're feeling. Um, now, again, the form score is, is designed to keep it um, a little bit less threatening by using a number out of 10 to communicate how we're feeling. But I think as a manager, and particularly as a manager working remotely, we're often all about the business. And I think we need to create one-to-one -one spaces. And it might not necessarily be with a manager. It could be with a peer or it could be with a buddy system where we, you know, we're just having coffee with other people in the organization, but we know we're going to talk about well-being. Um, but I think most challenges um, of mental ill health are noticed by spotting behavior change. So we've got to have a baseline to understand when there's behavior change. Now, we would normally get that visually. You know, yeah. People turn up at the same time. They had their coffee at the same time. They would typically go and get their lunch, perhaps go to the gym. You, you see people's patterns of behavior. Now, we're not seeing those now. So we need to replace those with asking how people are doing. But in, in a way that we're still building up some knowledge of what that baseline might be. Now that's difficult when you're remote all of the time. So for me, well-being check-ins are important um, to understand you know, what's going on for us with our well-being, what's driving it, what are our concerns, what are our pressure points. Um, another good one that I've heard used is something called well-being non-negotiables. So this is quite a cool concept. As a team, before you start a project, particularly if a busy time is coming up, you all say what your non-negotiables are. What are the one or two things you need to do each week to look after your well-being, to stay well? And you kind of you collectively write those down as a team. But then what the team does is kind of develop a social contract around it that we're all holding each other to account. So, you know, if Peter over there hasn't um, get, got home to put his children to bed and he would normally do so, and that's his well-being non-negotiable that day, then the other team members would be saying, hey, why haven't you done that? You know, if uh, Jenny um, didn't make the gym session that she would normally go to on a Tuesday, why haven't you done that? That's what you need to do to stay well. And I love that idea of holding each other to account around our well-being. I think that's pretty helpful, too. And, and is this, Rob, is this what you do for clients? Is that you go into a, a company and you set up an environment for better mental health? Yeah, I do a few different things. So um, I do a lot of sort of inspirational stuff. So that's keynotes to either senior leadership teams as to the why of well-being and the how. Um, or all hands meetings where I might be inspiring people to get on a personal well-being journey. For other clients, I would then do exactly that is, is help them with a well-being strategy, um, what that might look like, you know, what elements of you know, awareness, support, prevention we'd need to be looking at. Um, and then bringing tools like um, the one I mentioned, you know, the, the non-negotiables or other aspects at a team level for them to use. Um, so I do a whole range of, of stuff that's connected really to that idea of creating a mentally healthier workplace. Mm -hmm. And another thing for teams is to is to use the form score app, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm really excited about this because what we do with the form score, it's a simple concept. As I mentioned, you, you track your own form well-being with a score out of 10. Over time within the app, you can then build up an awareness of what's driving it because you tag sleep or exercise or connections as to what's affecting your score. So you build up some personal analytics. But importantly, what it allows you to do is connect with others. So if we're connected on the app, you see my seven out of 10 today, but you also would notice if I got to a four, in fact, you'd get a notification, your mate Rob is a four out of 10. And that facilitates peer support amongst you know, trusted colleagues, friends, family members. But I think then what, what's exciting about the workplace application is we aggregate those scores up anonymously and we've got effectively a real-time measure of team well-being and organizational well-being that we can cut up by different geographies or whatever. Now, this compared to a pulse survey, which is a moment in time and ignores pretty much everything that's gone on before, um, is real time. 
And so actually, if you've got a team that is showing a few people with low scores, you can then make sure that those resources that are available are being signposted to that team. If another team is showing that they're trending down on form because of sleep, then you can do a lunch and learn of sleep to that particular team. So you're personalizing your well-being interventions based on need within your organization and have got a real-time metric. So we're super excited about this. We've, um, we've been trialing it with workplaces. We're now converting some to enterprise clients and uh, are getting many more showing an interest in, um, in giving it a go. And I think Ogilvy Consulting were using it in the run-up to Nudstock, right? Yeah, so I, 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 I was really grateful and fortunate to present to Dan Bennett um, of Ogilvy um, when he was on something called the Marketing Academy. Um, and it was a great cohort of you know up and coming marketing directors. Um, and I got to sort of share my story and share the form score concept with them just before lockdown. And then Dan grabbed the form score concept and had been using it with the Ogilvy team um, through lockdown. And they found it really, really effective, which is how I sort of built the relationship up with them. And, and that led me to being on the, the nudge stock stage. So uh, I was super pleased that, you know, they found it useful at, at a team level. Well, I'm glad they did, and we discovered you at Nudstock. Yeah, um, thank you. Now, now you spoke about uh, earlier about COVID and the long-term effects of this. Um, what advice do you have for uh, people who would be feeling alone because of isolation on home office, or I don't know, maybe a, a woman in an abusive relationship, or even people that are, are not in kind of the home office environment? that are maybe working in a team face-to-face -face, like a zero hours contract. And, and even though they're in amongst people, they're feeling alone. Mm. It's a really um, difficult and, and it's a good question. It's a difficult one. So there's, there's a great book by uh, Narina Hertz called The Lonely Century. Um, and it talks, um, she wrote it actually prior to lockdown. And she talks about the rise of the contactless society. You know, you can do your yoga with Adrienne, you can get your food from Deliveroo, you can get your shopping from Ocado and uh, never see a person, right? Um, and loneliness is a real problem. She, was, she almost also talks about, in New York, and I'm sure you can get this everywhere, um, you can hire a friend by the hour, you know, nothing sexual. It's just actually hiring a friend that will come and have coffee with you or go shopping with you for professionals who haven't managed to find the time to build relationships and friendships. And I'm like, wow, you know, wow, this, yeah. is, this is staggering. And loneliness in the workplace, you mentioned things like zero hours contracts, um, you mentioned isolation through the pandemic. It's a real problem. Um, it's a real problem and it's, um, I think if the pandemic has shown us anything um, for all of us, it is the how important social connections are on our well-being. And there's lots of science that back this up. But we've had our social connections you know, forcibly removed to be safe and well because of the pandemic. But actually, as you point out, there are many people that are, are lacking in those social connections in, in their day to day life. And you asked me what 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 would I advise? What is the answer? So I think, you know, it's a big problem to solve for me. Um, for, for those of us that are not prioritizing their connections because we're too busy or we've got too much going on, my call to action there is actually understand and work out a little bit around what, what this actually means to you because you will be more productive, you will be more efficient, you will enter flow state easier if you are connected to other people, people that bring you joy. If you don't have that in your life, there will be a big hole that drains everything else and everything else will be much more difficult. So I think there are people, there's a category of people I think that could be prioritizing connections more, but don't because of choice. And I think we need to provide some education literacy as to the why. I think there's a sadder case though of people that genuinely don't have those connections. And I don't have the answers to this. And it's something that plays on my mind a lot in the context of form score because Form school is all about offering peer support. But what about if somebody's on the app and they're tracking their score and they find that quite useful, but they had they don't have anyone they feel comfortable connecting with. Um, and, and we've got to use technology to solve that problem, I think, and you know, get technology to a place where people can be supported on the app without that peer support network. So we'll do that. But I think we've just got to look at, at a societal level and, and think 
what is really important here, you know, um, economic growth, return on shareholder value, or, you know, happy, healthy economies, um, well, populations and, and, and workforces. And actually, what are we doing to facilitate connections, particularly when we're talking about changing the working model? So I think employers need to think about it's not just about you know three days in the office two days at home how are we helping people connect in our workplace and how are we catering for those that you know might not naturally be so exuberant or outgoing to forge those connections you know throwing people into different team situations you know you know putting people together in working groups from from different parts of a business i think there's a few ideas there and i think we've got to be creative but I don't have a satisfactory answer for you, but it is a question that is in my mind for sure, Brent. Um, is there, would, would it be advisable for people to, if they're on like WhatsApp with their friends or whichever uh, messaging uh, they, they are using, would it be better for them to not be typing, but rather FaceTiming, like on a video call? So does that add a little bit of extra connection? Yeah, so... I, Actually, WhatsApp groups um, have been shown. So I work with, on my advisory board, there's a, uh, a doctor of psychology, Dr. Linda Kay, um, and she's specifically done uh, some research on uh, the impact of mental health of WhatsApp groups. And actually, she has shown that there is a positive impact on mental well-being of the group. So there's around, um, you know, that level of support, that level of connection, that level of belonging and involvement you get from a group scenario. Um, so I think you know, the, the way we're using groups is, is important. Um, so we can get some positives. Um, I think the, the, the more bigger negatives around um, you know, social platforms are you know, the, the sense of perfectionism, the need to, you know, the perceived need to show uh, that we're having this amazing time when you know, it's all fake, right? No, nobody lives their life like they portray on, on, on social platforms. Um, the um, and there's a lot of hate on on platforms like Twitter that I think is very negative and, and bad for people's mental health. Um, should people be FaceTiming more? I mean, I think we're all a bit zoomed out, right? We're all a bit video conferenced out as a result of the pandemic. I think what people should be doing is now the world is unlocking in various different degrees. Is thinking about who gives you joy in your life. And are you getting enough nourishing content from those people that give you joy rather than, you know, being stimulated by the content of the multitudes that you are connected with in you know, 200 people on whatever platform you use? Um, focus on those people that are actually nourishing and give you joy and think, are you seeing enough of them? So I, I was fortunate enough to go for, for dinner at a, at a hotel last night. Um, my friend has opened a hotel. It's called Birch, the Sunday Times Hotel of the Year, and caught up with him and a good old friend. We all used to own bars together. And uh, it was just a wonderful experience, you know, just catching up with people that bring me joy. And we don't often do that enough. You know, we compromise on two things when we're busy, sleep and our connections. And these are the two things that really nourish us the most, right? Plus exercise. So, you know, for me, I think it's a choice thing. So if we're spending hours scrolling through people's Insta feeds or Facebook feeds, could we be using that time to be doing something meaningful with someone we care about? Yeah, actually, I when I was working in corporate, I basically got rid of all social media. And then uh, and now I have to um, do it a little bit for uh, work now. And I put Instagram back on my phone and was looking at it and I just found it actually absurd <laughs> it's really absurd the experience when you first go back to it after a detox it's it, it is a and detox is a great word for for social isn't it i think we do need those detoxes and and you know this one this might, might, might sound kind of ironic coming from someone that's developed an app that facilitates social connections right but i think there's there's facilitating connections for good and then there's the apps in themselves inherently aren't bad um it's what people do with them that can be bad but I'm with you. I, I don't use Facebook particularly. Um, I, I don't use Twitter particularly. Um, I find I find Twitter very difficult um, to, to engage with, even though from a marketing perspective, I should be using it more. Um, and that's a real um, challenge for me, I think, in terms of how I engage with these platforms from a business sense um, to what, what I think is good for me personally. 
Now, uh, just a couple more questions. I know you're very busy on this launch day. So um, th this is, again, from uh, someone, but I, I thought, yeah, this is quite an interesting one, um, that they said that they've noticed that young people, Gen Zs, I presume, uh, say that they are anxious and they have anxiety about exams or a job interview when is this just nerves or is it like genuine anxiety which is getting into mental health areas or is it trendy relabeling does it do a disservice to people with genuine anxiety what, what are your thoughts on this i think it's an interesting one um so i think the generations that are coming through uh, first of all are more open about their mental health which is brilliant so i think you know as we see you know my children come through um into adult life that the stigma won't exist when they're you know in their 20s um i, I think regrettably certain common mental health challenges such as anxiety are almost i don't want to use the word trendy but you know popular to talk about uh, and I think there will be elements of, um, you know, feeling nervous, being described as anxiety. And I think that, you know, we do need to be mindful of our language on, on this. Um, and I think that can diminish uh, someone who's got general anxiety disorder, which is and panic attacks, which is a, a you know, it's a serious challenge when you, you know, if you experience a panic attack for the first time, you actually feel like you're dying with a heart attack. Um, now that's not worries about exams, but yeah. I, I think I think, I, I suspect, and I think the data does back this up, that um, the, the generations coming through are also experiencing greater levels of uh, actual anxiety. Um, and, and I think our discussion before in terms of you know, perfectionism, the, um, the, the need to compare, the, 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 just the sheer uh, level of stuff coming at people from social media, um, will be pretty tough right will be pretty tough and it's a you know it's a pretty uncertain world you know if you are you know if you're in your teens right now you you will likely be worried about the planet right you'll be worried about you know what 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 the environment will look like in 30 years time when when you're my age and i think that that will create for some genuine levels of anxiety so i think I think some people will use the term inappropriately and it won't mean that, but I think there are rising levels of anxiety in society for sure. I mean, I think the World Health Organization, I think I'm quoting this right, uh, I've, I've said there's over a billion people that experience anxiety on the planet. Now, that's a staggering number of people. Um, and a lot of it will be, you know, the way that we're living, the loss of community um, and the, the virus will have amplified all of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's all very difficult. But yeah, I think there are really positive steps with uh, there's, there's so many celebrities, aren't there, that are speaking about this issue now, more and more sports people as well, which also helps because that's, you know, got that kind of, uh, you know, have to be focused and macho and stuff yep. like that. So it's, it's really great that people like that are speaking about it. Now, can I throw a couple of your uh, lighter questions back at you, Rob? Go for it. Yeah, go so for it. Go on. If, if mental health were a song, what would it be? So, um, there's, there's, there's probably two um, that I talk about, but there's a song called Over You by North Bass, and it's a drum and bass song, right? And um, I'm not a massive drum and bass head, but I appreciate music. But this was uh, a song that uh, I, I was riding the whole Tour de France on a static trainer in the name of Mental Health Awareness <laughs> three years ago. And cool. the O2 were involved and they let me ride a bike on top of the O2 arena. And we put this little promo video together and North Base allowed me to use this song. Um, and it, it, it's sort of, it's very, it starts off very kind of um, melodic and it just builds and builds and builds. And then the beat kicks in. And for me, it reminds me of the period when I come out of a depressive moment and I'm back to full attack and action. Um, so there's that one. And the other one I'd mention is um, a song by it's a, my favourite ever. I'm a house DJ, really. I play house music and um, Pete Heller, Big Love. Um, it's just the song that I've just had so many euphoric moments to with people that are very meaningful to me. And it's always one that I return to my DJ sets and play when I want to get a reaction. So that that is more the joy of mental health as well. I think I'd go for Love Train by the OJs. <laughs> oh, very good tune. Very good tune. Yeah. Um, and if mental health were a food? So for me, if mental health were a food, I think it would be 
a stir fry. So you've got many different ingredients. You can um, and it can it can change. It's never the same. You can you can do the same stir fry each time, but the spices will be different. The you know the protein might be different. It, it's kind of comforting in a way. Um, it's surprising. You share it. Um, so for me, it's a little bit unpredictable, um, and you don't quite know what you're going to get. Um, and it's all sort of up a, a hole that is bigger than the ingredients awesome okay and my now your question is how are you today which you always ask yeah my question that i always ask <laughs> it's going to be a strange one for you um this is to finish though so <laughs> okay. so um you have to choose the fight between a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses so which do you choose to fight and why So I've got to fight either a, a, a duck a huge, that's the size, a huge, huge duck. duck, yeah, or, or many, many, many very small horses. Uh, I'd fight the duck. Um, I, I'd fight the duck, um, and, and the reason for that is one: I think it would look funnier, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, you know, as far as fighting a big, huge animal could look funny. Um, so stamping on loads, you know, I've, I picture the horses that I'd be stamping on them. That would just look really cruel. And, and you know, they'd probably overwhelm you, but I just picture that image of stamping on little, <laughs> small horses. It just wouldn't feel right. Whereas, you know, a, a, a huge duck that I probably wouldn't win either of those fights, but clearly I'm not going to, you know, a horse-sized duck would probably just take me down in no second. But I think it would, um, it would feel like a fairer fight that I'm going to lose anyway um and i think it would look more amusing whereas the other one would look very horrific very good rob it's been honestly such a pleasure speaking to you and i know you're so busy today so i'm really really grateful it's been insightful fascinating and just super super useful i think for people listening so thank awesome. you so so much awesome well thanks for having me bren and you know love what you guys do at 42 courses so it's great to be a part of this and um you know appreciate you putting a spotlight on mental health and well-being too i really really like rob cut from a diamond to indulge in more rob go to formscore.today that's f-o-r-m score.today where you can also download the app for the Inside Out leaderboard, go to insideout.org. That's inside-out.org. And for Rob's keynote at Nudgestock in YouTube, just search for Nudgestock 2021 live stream, and you can find Rob in the description timestamps. For more well-being, come and have a look at 42courses.com for the Happy Course with Mike Viking from the Happiness Research Institute in Denmark. And coming soon the even happier course with Mr. Viking 2. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and if aliens land anytime soon, send out a smile to them too. Until next time, take care. <laughs>